everybody. My name is Callie Turner and I'm a volunteer for the Teen Talk podcast. One thing to note about me is I love fashion. So stay tuned for an interview with the one and only Virginia Bell. Hi, Ginny. So how are you today? Good, thanks. Great. So to start off, where are you from? I'm from originally Montreal, Quebec. Okay. And what do you collect? I collect anything to which the uh, expression of fashion or style can be applied. How long have you been collecting and how did you start? Oh, I hate to admit it, 65 years <laughs> <laughs> wow. since I was a teenager. Wow, yeah. that's a long time. Where do you find your pieces and how far did you travel? Uh, how far did I travel? I've been from San Francisco to Dominion, Nova Scotia to find my pieces and many points in between. Wow. Um, how would you define vintage? Uh, I would define vintage for me in, at my age, uh, anything pre-1965 before clothing became mass produced. Before that, uh, the workmanship was just totally different to what we know today, unless you buy something from Haute Couture in Paris, you know. Mm -hmm. How does a person recognize vintage? Well, there's several things. Uh, way back then, uh, they used four fabrics, linen, cotton, silk, wool. Uh, now it's a lot of it is polyester or rayon or whatever. And uh, you could also tell by the uh, labels. The labels were all beautiful back then, and they were woven. And today, they're just a lot of them are just stamped or, or whatever. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, metal zippers, uh, large hems, a lot of hem in the bottom of, let's say, a skirt. Today, there's no hem if you examine things, you know. Wow, you have a lot of knowledge. What means of support did you have to pay for your collecting? Uh, well, I uh, I had a shop for 21 years. Uh, before that, um, I, I would do shows. I would collect and then take some pieces that I didn't want to put in the collection or just use to, you know, make some money to support my collection. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite piece? Well, it was hard to pinpoint that. Uh, you know, that's, that's a difficult question. But uh, just off the top, I would think two blouses I have, which have been called convent blouses, been termed convent blouses. And that was an expression when I gave a talk at the Museum of the Atlantic in Halifax, the costumer for Neptune was there and she came, she just admired them and she said, these are convent blouses. And I said, what does that mean? She said, well, years ago in the 40s, 50s, 30s, very wealthy women would visit the convents in Europe and the nuns would make things to support their, you know, their living. And they would buy them, someone like, let's say, Jack, Jackie Kennedy or someone famous like that. And they were the most beautiful things you would ever want to see. I have two, and I hope they go into a museum someday, you know. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so amazing. And what are the rarest items you've collected? Well, I have a pair of shoes from the mid-1800s that are called straights. Uh, and that term is used because way back then, you didn't have a left and a right shoe. You had both shoes the same, so they're called straight. So I, I, uh, I like that, that, uh, those items. And also I have a wedding dress from the 1800s that I got at auction. And it was featured in the Settlers Museum in 1997 with a contest where uh, 14 participants uh, wrote wrote stories about the origin of the dress. Very, very interesting. Uh, it was found in a container in Newfoundland in 1912. And of course, my running brain thought, I wonder if it fell off the Titanic. Nobody knows, but anyway, um, it was preserved and it ended up in Windsor where I, I went to an auction and got it. Uh, great, great little thing for the F Settlers Museum. I still have that piece, of course. Wow, those must be really incredible items to have in your collection. Well, yes, because you you always wonder where they come from. Every time I buy something, I think of who wore it and where did they wear it. I, I always think of that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that women's bodies changed over time? Oh, yes. Uh, they were much smaller, the, let's say, the turn of the century. They were very much smaller uh, way back then. Waist size was maybe three, four inches smaller, and they were shorter. And that's evident, and if you go to England, even the, the houses have lower ceilings than we do. Wow, that's crazy. Um, do you prefer clothing now or before? Uh, I, I prefer clothing from the past. Um, there's always something in vintage that is, it looks current. And uh, for me, it's the workmanship. The workmanship back then was so beautiful. And they didn't scrimp on the material. You could have a, a hem that was like three, four or five inches. And as you and back then it was a sort of an economic thing because you put a dress on a young girl and a year later you'd have to let the hem down a couple of inches. You, you didn't. It wasn't a throwaway society back then. Yeah, that's so cool. Now all the stores just have mass production, and it's less special. Can you tell me a bit about your photography business? Yes. Well, I started this business to help. Uh, people recognize their integral beauty, and uh, I portray my subjects with dignity, elegance, and style. And I also believe that uh, by doing this, I help them with their self-esteem, because when they see themselves in a photograph dressed beautifully, I think that they, I think their self-esteem would, would rise. That's amazing. Um, how can people get in contact with you to set up photo shoots? Well, I have a, a site on Facebook called Virginia's Vintage Vogue Photography. And if they check on that, they could uh, message me. I was lucky enough to be photographed by Ginny and try on some of her collections at Virginia's Vintage Vogue Photography Studio. And I had such an amazing time and would recommend it to anybody. In the past... Have you worked with any museums? Yes, I've worked with the two museums in uh, our area, in Lunenburg County, Settlers Museum and Debrise Museum. Neither have a textile collection, so they come to me as a resource, and I'm always happy to let them uh, borrow uh, my collection for any of exhibit they might have. That's so fun. Is there anything else you would like to share? Well, I have a question for you. Uh, when you were modeling, uh, I you made a wonderful model, and I <laughs> wondered, you. did you know? Did you feel a sort of a transition when when you got into these uh, into these pieces? I definitely did. As soon as I put on the dress, I felt so much more glamorous, and I felt honored to be wearing these clothing items. And it was really cool thinking back on how old they were and when they were made and I really enjoyed it. And as my last final question, why did you get into all of this? Well, I was interviewed once by a gentleman who put uh, wrote for a magazine and I I thought to myself, how am I going to answer that question and why did I get into it? And it just it was a light bulb moment. I thought to myself, the greatest thing of all is thinking of people, specifically women, because that's mostly my collection is for women. And it made me think of the women in the past and and the women in the present too who wear this and the women of the future. It just it just made me think of people. That's amazing. Well I had a really nice time interviewing you today and I'm so glad that I got to talk to you once more. Well, you're welcome here anytime. I hope we have future sessions and uh uh I wish you all the best with your with your career. Thank your you plans. so much. You're welcome. Thank you everybody for listening and I hope you enjoyed this podcast and until next time. and I'm a teen volunteer from the library. First and foremost, I welcome you to another book podcast. Today, I'll be discussing and summarizing the book The Clockwork Angel by Cassandra Clare. 
Now, I'm not sure if you have ever heard of this book, whether from YouTube it being plastered around the bookstores, or maybe you have heard some of your friends or classmates rave about this book in the series that it is a part of. My point is that The Clockwork Angel is a part of a whole universe with so many books, and it will probably be one of the longest series you will ever read or have ever read. That being said, it is worth the long reading journey. This universe that Cassandra Clare has written is called The World of the Shadowhunters, and The Clockwork Angel is the first book of the trilogy called The Infernal Devices. Fancy name, am I right? Well, it gets crazier as the trilogies continue on. The story follows Tessa Gray, a 16-year-old girl who is living normally, until she decides to travel to Victorian England to be reunited with her brother, Nathaniel, known as Nate after their aunt sadly passed away. Unfortunately, now Nate is the only family she has left. Well, little did she know, by making a seemingly harmless trip to England, her life and everything she understood about the world was about to drastically change. When Tessa arrives in London, she is greeted by strangers who kidnap her. She soon learns that they call themselves the Dark Sisters, Oh, very spooky, right? Who work for a mysterious person called the Magister. To Tessa's surprise, she learns that she has the power to transform into another person, which is mind-blowing because Tessa never realized this. And even more shocking, the Dark Sisters understand the ability Tessa developed and possesses now and brutally teach and train her to use her new manifested special ability. So after weeks of Tessa enduring the Dark Sisters' dark ways, get it? She is saved from the demon-fighting warrior, better known as a shadow hunter. Tessa is overwhelmed by this new world presented in front of her eyes. And on top of that, she discovers that she too is a part of it. She was not aware of this hidden world because it is a world that is blocked from human eyes. Humans are unaware of the mythical creatures like werewolves, vampires, werelocks, and even shadow hunters and other supernatural beings that live among them. As Tessa questions her identity, she has to fight against the Magister, who runs a secret organization and goes through a long lens to keep their identity and plans hidden. He also goes above and beyond to try and recapture Tessa to utilize her special abilities. Along Tessa's journey in finding who she is, she meets new lifelong friends who are Shadowhunter warriors, and she also defends the human world from the Magister's dark plans and associates. Throughout the Clockwork Angel, Tessa faces many challenges on the way between the Magister, her friends, and her brother. One of the many themes of this novel is self-identity. After finding out she's a part of the world that she never knew existed, Tessa questions who or what she really is. During the book, she discovers and assembles pieces of information about herself together and attempts to discover where she belongs. I would rate this book a 4 out of 5 stars. I truly love this book and how the author has written it. The protagonist, Tessa Gray, is a fictional character and is an intelligent 16-year-old girl. She is very caring and generally has a warm personality, so it made it very interesting to read from her point of view, which was in third person. Additionally, the setting and the world building in this book were aspects I absolutely loved. Since the year of the book is based in 1878 in the Victoria era, it was intriguing to read about the different cultures, places, and fashions compared to nowadays. My only complaint about this novel is how long it took for it to get started. The reason why I didn't give this book a 5 out of 5 stars is that the plot took a while before the action and excitement started. In conclusion, I thoroughly enjoyed reading The Clockwork Angel. I recommend this book to anyone who loves fantasy and action. If you are interested in this fantasy book, I strongly advise you to start reading the first book of the Shadowhunter series, The Mortal Instruments, which are equally amazing books. But feel free to just dive into this book. You do not need to read the other series in order to understand this one. Thank you for listening to my review of The Clockwork Angel. Additionally, I hope you enjoyed all my comments and thoughts on the book. As it happens, this is not the last of the book podcast, so if you like this one, remember to stay tuned for more from Teen Talk. Hey 
everyone. My name is Katherine Naperska, and welcome to my segment of the Teen Podcast. So I'm pretty sure everyone here has heard of Twilight. You know, the series where Bella Swan falls in love with sparkly vampire boy Edward Cullen? Yeah, that series. So when I was first introduced to this series, there were two very polarizing opinions about it. The first opinion was, oh my god, it's so great, I love it, it's amazing, Edward is my spirit animal, that kind of opinion. The second opinion was, don't even do it, it's a waste of time, stay six feet away from that series, I hate it. So yeah, very polarizing opinions. I decided to read it because I wanted to form my own opinion about the series. I decided that there was really no harm in trying. Either it was a waste of time, if so, oh well, or it would be an amazing series. There was also another series which I had heard of, and also wanted to see what it was about. It's called The Vampire Diaries, which follows the story of Elena Gilbert, and is a love triangle between her and two vampire brothers, Damon and Stefan Salvatore. I knew there was a show, but I was the kind of person who would rather read the book first. I still am. And I haven't watched the show, so I will only be talking about the book version. And it was another one of those instances where I wanted to know what it was about and form my own opinion because I had heard about it. And that was when I realized that Twilight and the Vampire Diaries had a lot of similarities. And that, listeners, is what I'm going to be talking about in this podcast. Before I begin, I want to warn everyone listening that there will be spoilers about both the Twilight series and the Vampire Diaries series. Also, everything said here is going to be my opinion. I have no reason or will to insult anyone who likes both series. However, this is not a neutral discussion, considering I'm not a fan of either, so listen at your own discretion. So first of all, let's start with the characters. Twilight's protagonist is 17-year-old Bella Swan, who moves to a small town named Forks, where her father Charlie is chief of police. Seems like your typical beginning to a YA story, right? New girl, small town, new friends to be made, you know the drill. But one of the first weird things that struck me about the beginning was that Bella called her father by his first name. Okay, I get it. It's because Bella had been living with her mother in bigger cities in different states, so she didn't really feel like he was her father and didn't see him that often. I get it. But at the same time, it felt strange. The protagonist of The Vampire Diaries is 17-year-old Elena Gilbert, from Mystic Falls, Virginia. She's the most popular girl in school, revered and smart, caring, empathetic, and compassionate. Everyone knows her, boys drool over her. She's that kind of girl. Her parents have just died in an accident, so she's living with her sister at her aunt's place. Both Bella and Elena live in a small American town, and both are 17. The love interests for both series are also strikingly similar. So, Edward Cullen from Twilight and Stefan Salvatore from The Vampire Diaries are both vampires and chronologically must older, m- much, much older than any self-respecting human ought to be, but look about 18. They both are more or less scared of their abilities hurting people and don't need much food to keep themselves alive. They hunger for blood as any vampire would and have tragic pasts they remember, but those memories haunt them and they keep them secret from others. They also feel a pull or an attraction of some kind towards their respective protagonists. Edward has this thing where Bella's blood sings to him, which means that her blood is especially tasty for him, and it makes his vampireness come out more. It's almost like candy for a toddler. You crave it more than regular food, or in Edward's case, regular blood. Edward's family consists of his parents, Esme and Carlisle Cullen, and his four adoptive siblings, Rosalie, Alice, Jasper, and Emmett. The Cullens are what you'd call vegetarian vampires, because their diet consists of animal blood rather than human blood but they can drink human blood if need be. Stefan has a brother named Damon, who he was in another love triangle with back in the Renaissance era. There was a girl named Catherine, who they were both in love with, and when the time came for her to finally decide who to marry, she turned into a vampire, then turned both boys into vampires as well, so they would all three be happy together. Stefan and Damon were both incredibly disappointed and angry, so it was at that point where the two began to hate each other, and the next day, out of fury, the two brothers killed Catherine. What a messed up turn of events. There were so many better choices that could have been made there. The thing that connects Stefan to Elena is that she looks very similar to Catherine, his first love. And when Stefan meets her for the first time at her high school, he thinks she's Catherine, who has come back from the dead. Both series also have the best friend character and the person who the protagonist would probably have dated if not for the hot vampire. In Twilight, these are actually kind of combined into one. Bella has a childhood friend named Jacob, who we can all clearly see is attracted to her, but Bella doesn't notice no matter how obvious it is. 
However, Bella also has a bunch of new friends at her school, Angela, Jessica, and much more. In The Vampire Diaries, Elena has two close friends, Bonnie and Meredith. She also has a boy pining over her named Matt, who she's also kind of attracted to, but doesn't feel for him the way she feels for Stefan. So already we're starting to see a lot of similarities between the two series. Part two of the comparison is comparing the romance aspect of the series, because they are both romance, even though they have fantasy and supernatural thrown into them. And this is the part that irks me about the series. I get it, girls. He's hot, he's new, he's mysterious, and you feel this unexplainable pull towards him. Isn't that how most romances start? But if he has the capability of eating you, or killing you, or doing anything remotely dangerous to you that a normal human wouldn't be able to, why would you put yourself into that kind of danger? I also feel iffy about the whole, you love me, so you'd never be able to hurt me. He's a vampire. He literally cannot control his impulses to drink blood. What if he suddenly blanks out and can't stop himself? You're human. What can you do against him? Of course, in a case like this, the protagonist would be like, hey, stop, I know this isn't you, you could never hurt me, and the vampire would suddenly be able to come back to the reality. Or, the protagonist would be totally fine with having their blood sucked, totally fine, even to the point that they'd either die or get turned into a vampire themselves. Why? Why do you do this? I just think the whole dynamic of the girl pining for the hot, mysterious guy who's pushing her away because he's dangerous is messed up. I love a strong female character who's smart and knows when things aren't good for her, and for me, neither Elena or Bella did it. Also, the vampire dudes are always, like, really old chronologically. Stefan is from the Renaissance era, and Edward was born in 1901, but both look like regular high school students. I get that they were turned at that age and they need to have that, I'm not from this time, kind of vibe, but for once I'd like to read about a millennial vampire who's turned in the 2010s and has been in high school for the last 10 years, still uses the cringiest slang from the time, dabs, can't understand TikTok, and tries to be cool by wearing whatever's in right now but ends up looking like an NPC. For those of you who don't know what an NPC is, it stands for non-player character, and it's essentially a character in a video game who doesn't have anyone controlling them, and always ends up looking strange because AI rarely has any sense of style. I would buy that book in a heartbeat. Maybe I should write that, what do you guys think? Thirdly, let's talk about the other supernatural aspects of the series. In the Twilight series, vampires live all over, the, all over the world, in small families, so like maybe three people, sometimes more, and all the vampires have some superpower. That's something I forgot to mention earlier. Edward can read minds, his sister Rosalie is super beautiful, his other sister Alice can predict the future, his brother Emmett is super strong, and his last brother Jasper can manipulate the mood of those around him. Other vampire powers include controlling the elements, so like water, fire, air, and earth, having a mental shield to other powers, and being able to protect you and those around you with their mind, being able to communicate telepathically with others by touching them and having them know what you're thinking, or seeing every thought someone has ever had once you've had physical contact. The Twilight Saga also has werewolves. As we learn later in the series, Bella's childhood friend Jacob belongs to a wolf pack. Werewolves and vampires are sworn enemies too. Werewolves are in packs and can all communicate telepathically once in wolf form, and vampires are more solitary, and all have their individual powers. The Vampire Diaries doesn't have as many supernatural aspects. However, I've only read the the first book, and don't really plan on continuing, so maybe there are more supernatural aspects later on, I just am not aware of them. However, there is more of a mystery or whodunit aspect, because there are murders and people going mad and spooky things happening, and Stefan is being blamed for it, because he's kind of a lone wolf, and happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We do end up learning that it's not Stefan doing all those things, it's Damon, who is also alive. Although, can you be alive if you don't have a heartbeat? Undead, I guess, would be the proper term to use here. And here I think we have successfully come to the end of this podcast segment. This is a bit of a controversial topic. There will be some people who love these series and some who don't, and that's okay. Any fandom discussion is going to strike some kind of controversy. I hope you enjoyed listening to me today. Did you agree with my opinion? Disagree? Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye! Hello guys, this is Kiyo from Team Podcast. I hope you're doing great and having a fantastic day while listening to me. In uh, today's podcast, I'll be talking about the two recent TV shows that I watched in 
briefly explain to you why I like them and hopefully, hopefully encourage you to watch them. For me, like, TV shows will never replace films. And generally speaking, I see them as uh, entertainment, let's just say. I mean, you're bored, but not in the mood to spend like two hours for film. All right, you can watch an episode of something. It's not often that I watch a TV show and compare it to a real cinematic experience that I've had by watching a film. But sometimes, sometimes, not always, if a TV show has a good plot and uh, interesting weird characters i don't mind watching at least three episodes of it each day recently i've started two tv shows which i dare say were really cool and watching them was really entertaining so for the rest of the podcast you're going to listen to my opinions on these t- shows and my self opinion about them. Okay, firstly, I've just started watching Better Call Saul. It's uh, the spin of the one of the most famous shows of all time, Breaking Bad. I know most of you know that, and uh, I remember that I started watching Breaking Bad when I was fourteen or fifteen or something, and I was insanely in love with it. I mean, Breaking Bad, and I love watching. Every second of that masterpiece, the transformation of a camp teacher to a drug guy. I mean, come on, that's cool though. After I finished it, I remember that I literally got depressed and I was like, I wish that I could experience this spin off from Jesse's life, Hank, or Mike's at least, not the Skylar. <laughs> I remember that after a few weeks, I went to search about whether there was any spin-off from Breaking Bad uh, made or not in my nightmare just began. A spin-off from the worst and most ridiculous and stupid character in Breaking Bad universe. And guess who? Saul Goodman. At first I was like, there's absolutely no chance I will watch him anymore. But I did. Yeah, and let me tell you something. It was one of the best decisions of my life. It was literally the best decisions of my life. I want to say that everything about this TV show is made perfectly. Plots, conflicts, villains, and honestly many other things I can't even remember. But it's just great. It's just perfect. A sort of a coward lover with his messed up relationships and job is the best cinematic experience that you could get from the TV show. Hundred percent approved by me, and it's definitely the best TV show I've ever seen in my entire life. You must watch it, and it's just great. I mean, if you haven't watched Breaking Bad, it's okay. You still can watch it. It's just just watch it, you know, it's just great. Last but not least, the Vikings. If you like history stuff, especially the history of Vikings and how unique they used to live, fight, hunt, so many more interesting and old traditions that they had, you're definitely gonna enjoy a story of a poor but ambitious village man in thousands of years ago who's Aiming to head to the east of Earth and find unfound lands. And we see his adventures and also make his king proud that there are lands on Earth, you know, beside the ones that they know of. And however many more events happen in this six seasons TV show, but the whole plot of the story is about the kind of muscular guy named Ragnar that, as I told you, poor but ambitious village man who gets into many problems. I watched like traces of it, but it's just, that guy is like so cool. I assure you of that. And he gets involved in many fights, etc. It's not bad, it's definitely entertaining, I'm sure of that. But in terms of his story and 
let's just see logic of it and it could be better but overall it's really good and it's superiority over other historical TV shows are obvious I mean action scenes and how it increases your heart bit which is awesome I mean action scenes are very great so I believe that if you like to watch an action slash adventure maybe a little bit romantic th type thing Viking is definitely a great memorable option for you so I want to say thank you firstly for listening to me and also I hope that you enjoyed the time that I really 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 briefly shared my feelings and a, a quick opinion toward these two masterpieces so right now do me a favor and watch them and enjoy the beauty of them but please if you don't want to watch Vikings I mean that that's fine but you must watch Better Call Saul it's just probably the greatest TV shows ever been made uh, it's just fabulous you know so I guess till the next time have a good one you dear listener bye bye and I'm a teen volunteer from the library. First and foremost, I welcome you to another book podcast. Today, I'll be discussing and summarizing the book Shatter Me by Terhe Mafi. This book is a rebellious, romance-filled YA dystopian novel that follows the story of Juliet, a young girl whose touch can kill. With no one knowing why she's so dangerous, Juliet was imprisoned at an early age and the government has plans to utilize her strange power. A major part of Shatter Me is about Juliet coming to terms with her lethal ability and what it makes her. This book is by far a thrilling superhero story that has an unforgettable heroine. I am most definitely behind on reading this book. It was a very popular read 10 years ago, but here I am, I finally read it. And I'm going to inform you that I do not regret giving Shatter Me a chance. The book closely follows the tragic life of Juliet, who has been put in a very unfortunate situation that is not entirely her fault. So the situation at hand is that Juliet has developed a power that causes her touch to cause immense pain to whoever she may touch. Enough pain to possibly kill someone. And unfortunately, this is what happened. Juliet was trying to help a young boy, but because she did not have any control on her ability, she ended up killing him and was sent to, off to a mental asylum. Yikes. After 264 days of Juliet being locked in this place without any other company, things start picking up when someone named Adam arrives as her new cellmate. And this Adam guy turns out to be the only person that Julie has encountered who does not feel pain when she touches him. Hmm, well, this could only mean one thing in YA world. Could it be a potential love interest? The answer would be absolutely yes. By the way, this is not a spoiler because their romance happened so fast. I was surprised at how fast the romance started in this book. When recalling my reading journey, I was not aware that Shatter Me was equally a romance as it was a dystopian novel. Now the pace makes more sense, but not totally. Because, wow, Juliet and Adam fell in love faster than Bella and Edward from the Twilight books we all know and love. I like this instant love story going on between the two. However, this trope gives me the vibe that the couple is not going to last, which I dislike because I am definitely rooting for them. Sadly, Juliet has two love interests. Adam and this crazy insane guy named Warner, which I'm still confused about how he was even considered as an option, because he's also the villain of the story. To comment on the format of the book, for starters, it is very confusing. But believe it or not, Shatter Me is meant to be. The author even warns the reader, letting them know that the unique style of writing is not a mistake. There are strike throughs that represent Juliet's unstable state of well-being and her character growth throughout Shatter Me. For instance, on the cover, the sentence, my touch is lethal, is crossed out and replaced with my touch is power. 
This shows the reader Juliet's change towards how she regards her powers. I found this style of writing creative and clever because it shows all the versions of Juliet's thoughts and her development as a character. Additionally, the writing is very poetic. Throughout the book, Juliet repeats multiple words and passages. This enhances the meaning of what she's thinking and going through. Overall, I enjoyed Shatter Me. One thing I did not like was the limited buildup to the romance between Adam and Juliet. The book was too sappy at some times because of this. Otherwise, I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book. I loved how the writing helps readers fully understand the situation Juliet was in. Furthermore, the subject of the book was thought-provoking. Imagine not being able to embrace someone and have people fear and avoid you for something you cannot control. Another aspect I loved about this book was that it is really easy to read. You don't have to commit, just let the flow of the book do all the work. I could not stop reading once I picked this book up. I finished it in around five hours. I am definitely going to continue reading this series. I'm excited for what the next books will bring forward. If you like this book or have read any of the other books I'm about to list, I believe you will love Shatter Me or vice versa. Similar books to Shatter Me include The Match Trilogy by Ali Cody because of the love triangle and it is also a dystopian novel. Red Queen by Victoria Avriard because Warner reminds me of Maven and the characters have supernatural powers like Juliet. Lastly, the last book of The Hunger Games has a rebel system similar to that in Shatter Me. Thank you for listening to my review of Shatter Me. Additionally, I hope you enjoyed all my comments and thoughts on the book. As it happens, this is not the last of the book podcast, so if you like this one, remember to stay tuned for more from Teen Talk. Keisha was an average girl. She would often call herself one, too. Keisha got average grades, was of an average height and weight, and thought there was nothing special about her. One day on her way home, though, as she was walking down the gravel path on her way home, she experienced a strange sense of being followed. As she looked back over her shoulder, there was nothing, and she shrugged it off. It was spring, and the weather today was cool. Wonderful, Keisha thought because in this kind of weather we were the most birds. Yes, you heard that right. Keisha was a bird lover, and as unusual as it sounds, bird watching was her favorite hobby. Throughout her childhood, she would often sleep over at her grandma's house, which was in rural Ontario, and lie on her back on the wooden porch and listen to all of the sounds from the wilderness. It was also there where her grandma pointed out the various species of geese, birds, and ducks. Keisha was suddenly consumed by a desperate longing to run back to her grandma's old cabin and sit out watching the twinkling stars and being surrounded by birds. But she couldn't, and why she couldn't was as simple. Her grandma had died five years ago, when Keisha was nine years old. Now Keisha was fourteen and much different from her younger self. She was not as naive as she used to be, and Keisha was much sadder. Keisha was suddenly forced out of her trance when she heard footsteps come from behind her, and she whipped her head around. She was right in front of a woman with blonde hair and intense green eyes, which were fixated on Keisha. Oh, hi, Keisha says politely, waving before turning back to her path. Wait, the woman called. I need to talk to you, Keisha. Keisha froze. How did this lady know her name? Before she could open her mouth, though, the lady frowned. There is not much time to explain, but I'm your aunt, Hannah. To prove her point, the lady showed her ID over to Keisha to prove it. Come with me, Hannah yelled as she started moving in the direction of a black Volkswagen. Keisha did as told. She indeed remembered her aunt from all of the family gatherings she had attended as a kid. After they had settled in the car, Hannah started driving. Keisha didn't say anything through the whole drive. As we pulled up to the parking lot of her grandma's old house, Keisha was very shocked by how much had changed. The house was old and rickety, unlike the very cozy cabin she remembered it as. Hannah didn't say anything and tugged Keisha's hand, and together they entered the home and went down the stairs to the basement. 
As they reached the bottom, Hannah turned to Keisha. There's something you should have. As she turned a do- doorknob of a storage closet, Keisha gasped. Inside the old closet were books and bird watching equipment. Before Keisha could express her thanks, she was tugged away, and in a flash, she was outside in the backyard on the porch. On the grassy field in front of the porch was a grave with a headstone that stated the person's name. Kellen Smith. Keisha felt tears prick in her eyes. It was her grandmother's grave. She reached forward to brush the dust accumulated on the surface. Hannah finally turned and said to Keisha, Your grandma's home was inherited by me. That's why your mother didn't mention me and why we don't talk anymore. But I'm going to tear down this house soon. The construction crew should be arriving. Hannah sighed before saying, I'll give you some space. Keisha nodded before sitting down and crying. I miss you, Grandma, she thought. The end. Hey guys, it's me, Brian, and today's topic is high school tips from an almost graduate. Tip number one is when you're walking in the halls, when you're going in the direction that you want to, stick to the side that everyone that's going in the direction that you want to is going. Because if you're walking on the left-hand side and everyone who's walking on the left-hand side is going towards you and not with you, you're on the wrong side and you're going to get yourself stuck. Tip number two is to avoid certain foods from your cafeteria. So, um, the pizza, uh, sometimes the fries, but more specifically sweet potato fries, and any sort of food from different, like, cultures that they're trying to replicate, it's not the actual thing, and it's sort of a waste of money because it's overpriced as such. Honestly, go for the cheaper supplies because A, you're going to just need to repurchase those expensive supplies in about a semester because of how much work you do in one class. And B, you're going to, it's going to get rained on pretty hard and like, I don't know, just skip out on the pretty stuff and get more of a practical assortment of supplies. Tip number four is to do everything. Do everything, you know? You don't want to be in your last days of high school wishing, oh, I wish I had done that, and oh, I wish I would have done this. Go join that team. Go join that club. Do those activities. Do whatever pleases your heart and whenever. The worst that could happen is you don't get on that team. But, you know, what, what could have, what, what, whatever that saying is, you don't want to be regretting anything in the last days of high school because most of it's going to be tears. So, do whatever you want to do. Do whatever activity you want to do, you know? It's up to you. Tip number, number five is that or more so of advice, is that many of the friends that you enter high school with, you don't exit high school with. So, but that doesn't mean you don't gain some, you gain, you, you, you gain, you, you get more friends while you're in high school. But many of those childhood and junior high day friendships sort of come to a halt once you enter high school. So, You know, don't be heartbroken when it happens. It'll be inevitable. Not everybody stays the same. And, like, people change. Friendships change. You know. So, don't regret what friendships ended. Just be thankful that they had started. Tip number six is do not skip. Don't skip. It's not worth it. You're going to fall behind. You might be able to catch up, but if you're somebody like me, you're probably going to miss out on, um, a lot, and you're going to fall behind, and your grades are going to slip. So, 
to avoid that, just maybe don't necessarily skip, but don't purposely, continuously skip. Tip number seven is do not involve yourself with other people's dramas. In- including yourself into other people's problems is a recipe for disaster and you know it's not that great you're not gonna you know so yeah just um yeah so don't involve yourself in other people's dramas you're not gonna get yourself anywhere you might get yourself in a lot of trouble so just stick out of the drama tip number eight is appreciate things more you know you might enter high school and think oh this is gonna suck all these classes but you're but once you get into older grades the things you didn't want to appreciate you will want to start appreciating so appreciate the fact that grade 10 classes they might be hard in some cases but they're not as hard as older grades and don't continuously say oh i have it rougher than you because you don't know what people have going on inside of them tip number nine is to you know try your best do the best that you can do in that class and your grades will you know don't be, like, slacking and then be like, oh, why aren't my grades good? Like, just do what you have to do and you'll have the grades that you'll need for secondary education and such. Tip number 10 is don't be afraid of what's about to happen and what's about to, or what's going to come in the future. You know, as a grade 12 student, I realize now, I don't know what I'm doing five, ten years from now, but I'm not afraid of it. I'm excited about it, you know? Like, it's a fun, it's a fun experience, you know? It's a fun time. And so, yeah, don't be afraid of what's to come. Just live in the moment. Don't wish away these years because they're going to fly by faster than you think they can or they could. Well, so that was my podcast segment for today. Uh, This is me signing off. Um, I won't be returning in the fall because I age Joe of the volunteering, the team volunteering program. So I hope everybody Has a great summer and woohoo!